we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Shot Science Overtime number 59. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us, and I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, I want to remind you guys that if you want to ask your questions, please send them to us. Um, at Shot Science on Twitter is a great place to hit us up. You can hit us up in the chat of this video or in the Q&A app, um, and you can ask anything basketball. Uh, we will try to get to everybody's question as long as it is, you know, in good taste. Um, and uh, so send us your questions and also go out there and tell everybody that you're with or that you know that is into basketball to come check out uh, the Shot Science Overtime live show right now. And if you do that, it helps us bring in other great guests so that we can, uh, you know, have a lot of great basketball content for you guys. So it really helps everybody. Um, so today, and I... By the way, I'm Casey. This is Coach Tom. Um, but today we have a very special guest who uh, is one of the directors at the Point Guard College uh, that you might know about if you're into anything basketball. Uh, his name is Tyler Costin. And uh, we just want to welcome Tyler, and he's going to give you a little bit of background before we kind of get into our topic of the day. So uh, welcome, Tyler. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it, Casey. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here and talk basketball. And uh, let's give, if you don't know about PGC basketball, um, man, it's been one of the blessings of my life to be able to coach with PGC. I actually had my first interaction with PGC as an athlete the summer before my senior year of high school. And uh, as a junior in high school, I loved basketball as much as anybody. I just wasn't that good. <laughs> and I didn't know how to get good. And I really wanted to be good. And uh, I attended Point Guard College with the founder of PGC, Dick DiVenzio, who's uh, just a great basketball mind and author. And it changed my entire perspective of the game of basketball. And it taught me how to play, how to prepare, and it taught me how to win. And I got really different results my senior year. I led my team to a state championship. I got college scholarship offers. And I truly trace it back to uh, that one experience. I went on and played my college basketball. Um, got to play pro ball overseas for a year. And then I got into college coaching, and I coached uh, four years of college basketball, uh, two years on the women's side um, at Division II level, and then I coached uh, two years on the men's side at the Division I level as a, an assistant at Portland State. And so I kind of came full circle about uh, six and a half years ago. I was asked to get back involved with PGC, and uh, I've been a director with PGC for the past six years. And uh, I'm excited to be able to talk basketball because that's what I do all year long is uh, help athletes achieve their vision like uh, PGC helped me. So thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about with you guys. Awesome. That's great. Awesome. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that uh, you might spend just a moment or two talking about is, is uh, a couple of words about Dick uh, DiVinzio. DiVinzio and, and how he got started with the Point Guard College. For sure, yeah. So Dick DiVinzio actually played his college basketball at Duke University. He's out of Pennsylvania. His dad was a longtime coach. He actually played for his dad in high school. Um, there's actually a book that Dick DiVinzio wrote about his dad called There's Only One Way to Win. Um, and we, we sell that at our, our website, pgcbasketball.com. And it's just a really cool book about how he learned um, how to play the game the right way. And uh, then Dick DiVinzio, after he finished playing at Duke, he played a little bit of pro ball overseas. And then he, uh, he's, he was a very accomplished author. Um, he wrote the best basketball book I've ever read called Stuff Good Players Should Know. And if you haven't read that book, Stuff Good Players Should Know, you need to read that book. That was my basketball Bible um, growing up. And uh, then he started uh, a, a ton of basketball programs, actually, and one of them being the Point Guard College. And uh, he ran that, um, started it in the mid-'80s, and he ran that until his uh, unfortunate death in 2001. And... Um, yeah, it's impacted. It's funny. I go to Final Fours and I run into college basketball coaches, and it's unbelievable how many people in basketball know about Dick Davinzio, attended PGC, um, or read his books. He's just been a kind of a common thread through basketball, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cool to be a part of that. I can remember those books myself. It was a long time ago when I was a younger guy, but yeah, I remember those as well, and his names. Nice. Okay. So what are some uh, kind of the resources and, and uh, things that people can get through Point Guard College? For sure, yeah. You know, you can like us on Facebook at PGC Basketball. We uh, About four years ago, we changed the official company name from Point Guard College to PGC Basketball in order to communicate that we're not just for point guards. Um, you know, we, it originally was, a, was, a, was just for point guards, but now we've expanded the courses we offer to teach basketball. And really, I think everyone in the game that's going to be good is going to be a point guard. I call LeBron James a point guard. He's a playmaker and a leader. I, for me, that's a point guard. Um, but yeah, and you can check out, um, we run five-day summer sessions all across the U.S. We're going to offer 72 five-day sessions 
um, across the U.S. this summer, pgcbasketball.com, at pgcbasketball on Twitter. Um, yeah, please check us out. We'd love to see you and uh, help you achieve your goals. Awesome, yeah. And, you know, if, if you want to go check out their Twitter and, and uh, other pages and stuff, make sure you tell them you're from Team Shot Science just so that, uh, you know, we know that you're headed over there and checking stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah awesome. So we can definitely talk more about that in, in a little while or whenever you feel like it needs to be brought up. Um, but also I just want to remind people to send us their questions. Uh, if you have any question about basketball that you want answered, uh, you know, today would be a great day because we got Tyler here and he's ready to, to help you guys out. Um, so it's just tweet at us. We are at Shot Science, or you can send it to us in the Q&A app or on the, in the chat. Wherever you want to send it to us, we will try to find it and, and ask Tyler and, and get some expert opinion on it. Um, but right now, uh, we're going to jump over into kind of talking about the topic that we chose for today, which is uh, what coaches look for in their players. And, you know, I think Tyler would be a solid guy to go to for this one and, and see what his opinion is on that one. So what do you think, Tyler? Yeah, let's, well, here, first I just want to clear something up for players out there, especially young players. I often hear players and parents complain about coaches playing favorites, and that constantly blows my mind because every coach has their favorites, and your job as a player is to become one of them. So I think that excuse of coaches play their favorites, I mean, you're, you're putting yourself behind the eight ball right away if, if you're using that as an excuse. The whole goal as a player is to become the coach's favorite. And I don't know a coach in the country that doesn't love players that work hard, get better, come early, stay late, encourage their teammates, and get good at what the coach cares about. Uh, I mean, we run into players all over the place that care about um, things that their coach doesn't care anything about at all. They care about their sick crossover when their coach just wants them to make layups. And so I, I tell players, man, get good at what your coach cares about. If your coach loves box outs, get good at that. You're going to play more. You know, if your coach really likes um, – you knocking down threes, spend your time knocking down threes. Um, that would be my first thought. And then my second one real quick would be this. There's very few players that are good at a lot of things. Most players play because they have one specific skill that they're known for. And coaches want, know, want to know what they can count on players for. And so instead of spending your time working on a whole bunch of different things, pick something that your coach cares about, get good at it, and then you'll get playing time. So that'd be my, my initial thought. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about almost every week is that it's more valuable to be, it's, it's better to be a well rounded player because that's more valuable to not only yourself, but a team. And, you know, you might be asked to step in somewhere. And, uh, it, you know, if you're a good leader, if you're a good, uh, all-around player in terms of your skills and your positive energy and you know you're you're just kind of just this really nice person that that anybody would want to have on their team that just raises your value up right. and uh, you know coaches look for all those little things like uh, initiative effort uh, hustle all those little things really all add up for sure I, I really enjoyed your remarks though about uh, coaching having favorites because uh, for me <laughs> you're right on you're right on and uh, you know, I'm in kind of a situation uh, locally where uh, I have a lot of students from all the different schools around that, that I deal with, and so uh, a lot of those parents feel like they can tell me all kinds of things about the coaches as well. I never repeat them to anybody, really, but uh, it's interesting how many complain about the fact that uh, their coach is uh, favoring his son way more than their son, and he should be playing more. It's it's interesting to hear that. I love your your comments on that. Yeah, I mean definitely. And you just got me thinking too. I was uh, I was actually watching a Detroit Pistons game, and Tom Izzo, the head coach of Michigan State, got in the booth and spoke for about ten minutes, and he just said some some really interesting things about what you know a Division One very successful coach is looking for. And and he said, you know, I don't always recruit the most talented players. He's like, anybody I'm looking at is talented. He said, but one thing that I really care about is I care about if a player is going to get better, if they're a gym rat, if they're going to get in the gym and get better. Um, so a lot of times it's not even a coach isn't just looking for talent. It's a, it's a player that they can trust to continue to improve and to work. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, you could maybe look at some uh, team like the, the Spurs or something like that. And, you know, they're just chock full of guys that are just well-rounded players. They're good guys. They all hustle and know how to work. And, uh, you know, they're maybe not the best players in the league, or at least they aren't anymore. 
uh, but they just they just they just win because they have that kind of uh, total package going for them. Definitely. Okay. Okay, so uh, you know, let's jump into some questions here because we we we're kind of getting a bunch of them. Um, but uh, I want to remind people if you want to get your question answered, we will shout you out. So uh, send them to us here at at Shot Science. We are at Shot Science on Twitter, or you can shoot them over to us in the in the Q and A app or in the chat for the video. And also tell your friends because we want to get some more people over here checking out uh, what we're doing. Um, okay, so here's the first question we're going to go with. This is from, uh, let's see, Tay Fonick, who says, will coaches be looking for guards that assist more than shooting the ball? So I, I guess they're looking for point guards that are maybe distributors more than they are scorers. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that one real quick. Sure. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Coaches... You know, first off, when you're looking at going to a college, I, t I tell players that I'm helping all the time, fit is a huge part of picking the right college program. You, you want to go somewhere where that college coach values your skill set. And there are coaches that value a lead guard that's going to score, and there's coaches that value a lead guard that's going to distribute the basketball a little bit more. Um, and so you got to find the right fit. Otherwise, you're, you're going to go there and be really, really frustrated and sit on the bench. Um, but that being said, you must be able to create offense. I, I believe as a lead guard, you got to be able to create offense. And that is this, whether you create a shot for yourself or a shot for your teammate, what it comes down to is the ability to beat one man. If you can beat one defender and cause a second defender to have to guard you, you've created offense. You've created a shot for somebody. If that second defender doesn't come and guard, you've created offense for yourself. It's the same skill set. It's the defense that determines in that moment if you're a playmaker or a scorer. Mm. Right. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Okay, great. Um, okay, this one is from Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> he says... Uh, Welcome back from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> when I practice in the morning in the gym, I try to work on as much as I can, but I end up mostly working on my shot. What should I do when I practice in the gym so that I make the most out of my gym time but still work on all of my game? I don't want to hog it. If you guys want to jump in first, or oh, no, you're, no, no, you're our guest. We'll jump in there too. If uh, it's whoever, uh, whoever is prepared. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, hey, I would just go back to what I said before. Like, get good at what your coach cares about. That's going to be the most efficient use of your time at the gym. And get good at what's going to get you shots in your role in your offense. If if your offense is one where you know you're spaced on the floor and you're playing off the ball, you gotta you gotta be able to knock down or off the catch three. You gotta be able to do that, and that's what you should spend your time on. If you're if the only way you're gonna get more playing time is to be a lockdown defender, well man, I'd be working on your speed, agility, footwork, and, and get better at that. You know what's gonna be your biggest return on investment? If you don't know what your coach wants you to get better at, ask him. That's the best use of your time. You know, uh, a thought that, that comes to my mind as you say that is that often players don't really communicate with their coach, whether they're uh, afraid to speak to them uh, or what. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll ask us questions, uh, you know, about maybe the reasons for not playing, and, and you know, we, we can't know. And so we usually refer them to this, is that, listen, your coach will listen to you as long as you approach him in a, uh, a mannerly way, that you don't just come in and, and uh, be demanding and, and kind of uh, entitled. entitled or uh, a little uh, coarse and nasty. But if you just talk to them, they'll usually sit down and say, okay, this is, this is what I see, and this is what you need to do to work on uh, to get better. And uh, they just don't seem to understand that uh, the coach is – will listen if you just kind of talk to them. Definitely. And one thing we say at our, our summer programs, because we teach a lot of things at our summer programs, but I say at the very beginning, hey, if I say something that's different than what your coach teaches, who's right? And the correct answer is your coach, because they control your playing time. Your coach is right. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's got to be one of the first things. If you care about playing, you got to talk to your coach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that, you have to kind of gauge what is important for you as well. Uh, you know, if you're struggling at something, you probably need to put a little bit more time into that. Um, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, wanting to be a more well-rounded player, you're going to have to take the time to put all the pieces together in your practice routine to make sure that you're developing all those skills as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is no magic answer for everybody that fits, you know, one size fits all. You have to kind of know 
where to slide things in and where to move things out, and and it's a it's it's a game where you kind of have to be your own coach as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. All we... right. Let's see. Let's go to Twitter on this one. This one is from Dan, Daniel Sijakovsky, who's here most all the time. He says, or he's from, he's at Prodigy 3F3CT, and he says, uh, nearly dominant on the streets and for my club, but do very little for my school team. Is it just because I'm a freshman? So I guess he is, he's doing well when he's playing uh, kind of uh, the less structured leagues or something like that. Sure. So any thoughts on that one? Yeah, you know, these are, these are very specific questions, you know, where it's tough to really give you an answer without knowing your specific situation. Um, one, one suggestion for you would be this, though. <clears throat> in the streets, summer leagues, AAU, it's a lot more, on average, a much more individualized game. Much more, hey, it's your turn now, go get yours. Um, and usually, you know, when, when you get into a school ball situation, it's a lot more structured game. And so I think focus a little bit more on what you can do well to, to get your teammates open, get your teammates easy buckets. What can you do well as far as being in the right positions? I would say, you know, focus more on precision. I know that as you get to higher and higher levels of play for better and better coaches, they really value precision. I had the opportunity to be at a Duke practice last year and uh, sit down on one of his private practices, and Coach K handed uh, us out his practice plan, and his thought for the week was precision, which is doing things exactly right over and over again. It's what great coaches care about and uh, really can, can help you fit in to a new system or a system you're trying to break into. Yeah, and you know, one of the other things too that we always say is super important is to have the three different pillars of, of working out or, or practice, essentially. And <clears throat> that is, number one, you have diligent practice where you're working on dialing in everything that you can uh, in terms of your mechanics, so whether that's the form shooting drill or uh, very, uh, you know, two ball dribbling or pounding the ball, dribbling, or whatever it is, then you take it to the next step, which is game speed, game intensity workouts, um, where you're taking the skills that you work to develop while you were working in the diligent practice, and you kind of work on where you're going to be when you actually step into the game, and then you have your actual game play where you are taking those skills and you're actually putting them against other people, which is where things start to fall apart. But if you get that experience, and and it sounds like you are when you're going out and you're playing on the street or you're playing uh, for your club team, that's where you kind of put all of those together. Then the next step after that is is stepping into the more structured leagues and stuff like that. But it takes time and it takes experience. It's not all just going to happen for you. You just have to put the work in and, you know, eventually it'll be there. Yeah, and I can just add one more thing to that because I think this, this happens to a lot of young players is understanding that improvement is not a straight line. I mean, a lot of players think that there's a direct relationship between the amount of time they put in and how, how talented they are, how good they are, how successful they are, where you can flatline for months and all of a sudden you see a huge jump. And I see a lot of players get discouraged because they're like, I'm putting in this time, but I'm not, seeing, I'm not beating these guys on the court that I, I should be beating. Don't quit. I mean, stay diligent because you might be quitting the day before you see a huge jump. I know... Players I've worked with my own career, that's how I improved my, my outside shooting, my vertical jump. You know, it, 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 sometimes you get worse before you get better, too, as, you, uh, as, you're trying to get, as you're trying to get a new skill. So don't quit. Stay diligent. It'll happen in leaps and starts. One of the things that kind of goes along with that thinking, too, that, that uh, I spend time talking with our students is that when you eventually take your skills to the court, uh, express, ex, expect that failure is going to be the first result. And then after, this is just like riding a bicycle or, or skiing or snowboarding or anything like that. Your first stabs are usually not going to work out for you. Uh, and, but then you begin to kind of figure it out and you adapt uh, what it is you're trying to do to the competition. And pretty soon you start to register some, uh, some successes and those begin to outnumber the failures. And, and they seem to understand that when you put it that way. Yeah, that's a great point. Failure, failure is uh, the biggest part of basketball, and we spend a whole, uh, a whole session talking about how to approach and address failure. And yeah, that's great. I mean, the biggest thing of failure is you should pile them up because until you fail a thousand times, you're you're not going to have developed the muscle memory. I mean, you stand on that pile of failures for your success. Michael Jordan missed more game winners than he made, and uh, yeah, that's great. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you think about those guys like LeBron or Michael Jordan or Kobe or who any anybody, and you know they <clears throat> they did not wake up and have those things happen for them. Uh, they mm-hmm. they put in tons and tons of work to make themselves where they are today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody has to go through the process. It's not <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not a magic pill or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and here's here's another question that we got along the same lines from Chaos Two Six One One in the chat who says, I keep doing ball handling, or I keep doing handling drills, but I don't feel like I'm getting better. How do I know if I, if I get better? Well, <clears throat> I think that you probably are getting better if you're putting in the work. You need to make sure that it's a diligent approach to your practice. So you're, you're looking at all the little, uh, you know, little things that, that add into uh, what makes your ball handling develop. Um, and you probably are getting better, so maybe, maybe – Videotape yourself. See, well, see, like the little little things that are changing. Well, and I, I know that this young man happens to be a younger a younger player because he's with us a lot. Uh, but one of the things I think goes back to what Tyler was saying a while ago is that you know your your growth uh, in skill development is not always just on an upward plane. Sometimes you hit those points where just nothing seems like it's going right. You want to address that again at all, Tyler? Yeah, and uh, I think I, I got two points here. Um, first, just kind of addressing the the failure piece. I often I often compare it to choking. So if if you're choking on a piece of food, you're probably not going to give yourself a Heimlich one time and be like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like like if you're choking, man, that first attempt doesn't work. You run and try something else. You, find a friend, throw yourself against a chair, and I don't know why so many basketball players, they try something once or twice, it doesn't work, and they're like, well, I'm not a good ball handler. Yes, uh, exactly. No, it's like you're choking. You run around frantically and trying something else um, and, until you until you find a way. At least that's that's what champions do, want people that succeed. Um, and then just my second thought about ball handling, just going back to it, I might define ball handling different than most people, and I think defining what a win is or what success or what improvement is is also important. And I think a lot of young players especially work on the wrong things when it comes to ball handling. I think dribbling and ball handling are different. And here's, here's my definition. And I, you know, I don't know if it's different. It probably is different than a lot of people's. Dribbling is being able to not lose the basketball and stay in one spot without the defense taking it. Ball handling is the ability to get anywhere you want to on the floor. And I find that a lot of young players spend a lot of their time working on dribbling and then in games are frustrated that their ball handling isn't good because they can't get to where they want to get. They can't beat somebody, but they're, but they're sitting there piddling with the ball between their legs for, for hours. And so I think that ball handling requires – well, I think it's three things. I think to be a good ball handler, you have to be able to handle the ball with speed. You have to be able to take contact without losing the basketball, and contact is a huge thing that players don't train against. You've got to train against contact. That's the game. And then finally is vision. And a ball handler is able to move at speed against contact with vision. The moment you lose one of those, you're not a ball handler anymore. So I'd encourage uh, young players to try to train at speed with vision and find some contact. Right. Yeah, and you know, one of our big teaching points, too, is, is dribble economy. And you're, no, you know, you're not wasting dribbles if you don't need to use them. And if you're just standing there dribbling, that's not really going to, to do anything for you. And you can do as many uh, little flashy moves in a stationary position to thrill everybody in the crowd, and that's not going to do anything to get you the, the, the bucket that's going to actually count. So you need to be able to have those ball handling skills to attack off the dribble. We, you know, we call them dribble attacks. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that's, that's an essential skill. And like you were saying, contact is part of it. Uh, the the angles are a big part of it as well. Um, you know, the foot footwork and and the quickness and foot speed. Those are all those all kind of go into it. So uh, definitely, you you need to train not just on your ball handling ability to you know put the ball uh, around you in in uh, you know impressive ways, but also be able to. Uh, explode off out of the you know a standstill and use those dribble attacks. Yeah, you know, sure. Yeah, we call at PGC we call those P dribbles. Uh, it's just like you know you're just you're just peeing on your feet. You know you're not going anywhere with it. Right. Yeah, right. The big term. Hey, if you're if you're going to pee out in the woods, you'd probably pee as far away from your feet as possible. You wouldn't pee on your feet. Same thing with the basketball. Uh, I exactly. love that analogy. I love it. Well, you have another 
pee on it. Well, I know. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I usually teach when we're getting into the ball handling phases, too, is that understanding what what uh, uh, ball handling and dribbling is all about. Um, you know, you see a lot of people who do a lot of extraordinary things with these little mini dribbles and all of that. Uh, for me, uh, what really counts is how do you control the basketball in all situations? And that's really what it's all about for me, is controlling what you, what you want to do with the basketball in, in, you know, a lot of different situations. Mm -hmm. but like you say, you're being challenged and you have to take contact or whether you're uh, retreating away from that uh, defensive player and how you're going to handle all that. So control of the dribble really is, is key for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. That's yeah, great. well, I mean, it's all about creating opportunities. It's really what it is, scoring opportunities. Yeah. And, you know, you're not going to get, you know, <clears throat> points or style points or anything like that for <laughs> the things that you do when you're out on the perimeter and, and you know, doing anything out there. You get the points when you put the ball in, in the hoop, and that's, what the dribble serves is is yeah. doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we I think we hammered that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got our soapbox on that one. <laughs> yeah, that was the rant for the day, I guess. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go back to Twitter. This is from at itzj1mbo, who is it's Jimbo, I guess. Uh, who says, how do you change from being a big man to a guard slash forward? Because I will have to play that position when I move up a level next year. Mm -hmm. And I would say a large portion of the athletes that come to PGC are in that situation. Um, and so first, <laughs> shameless plug, come to PGC. <laughs> okay? And uh, especially our essential scores. And we get a ton of uh, athletic players that grown up through youth ball. They just, you know, they grew early, and so they're stuck under the basket. And um, so here, here's what I would suggest. The first thing that, that you've got to do is you've got to put yourself in situations that um, are uncomfortable. So a lot of times young players that are used to just being around the basket and you know playing post, when they play pickup, when they practice, when they go to open gyms, they just migrate there so they aren't putting themselves in situations to improve. If you know that, uh, that you're going to have to make a transition, you've got to be, you've got to be uh, Steve Nash, I love this quote by him. Um, he said it back when he was with the Phoenix Suns. He said, I am uncomfortable being comfortable. Uh, when asked how he is able to continually improve through his NBA career, uh, which basically means, man, if, he's, if he was moving at a comfortable speed, if he was doing something he was comfortable and good at, he, he was like, this is wrong. i got to change it. Because you don't grow and you don't change if you're comfortable. you got to stretch yourself. So that would be, that'd be the first thing. Um, put yourself in those situations. And then obviously you're going to need to be able to handle the ball better. Um, and I, I believe handling the ball is, yeah, it's dribbling and moving with the ball. But it's also being able to make passes with timing. It's also being able to get open on the perimeter. These are things that a lot of post players really, really struggle with. And they are things that we spend a lot of time on in our essentials course. So I'd really encourage you to get there. Yeah, and you know, like we, we said earlier, it, make yourself a valuable all-around uh, skilled player. I mean, you don't want to be just a big man because that really pigeonholes you. And you might find yourself where you're playing behind a couple guys because you, you know, aren't you're not as good a big man as they are. But if you were had worked on developing your all-around skills, maybe you could slide in and play the three, maybe even uh, a shooting guard position. I mean, it, it's one of those things where you need to up your value because it will only help you and your team to be that well-developed player. Yeah, you know, I, I think also that uh, um, some of those players that we're talking about, so they're kind of tweener players, really, um, are really reluctant to move away from, let's say they're, they've been a post player as a youth player, but now they're afraid to move away because they don't have the skills for that, and yet they're really reluctant to spend a whole lot of time because they're not realizing any immediate success maybe in playing in those positions as well. So. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, too, I think they, they want to slap a label on themselves, too. You know, yeah. they want to be the point guard or they want to be the center or whatever. And that is, that's not something that you should ever really do. You, you can let your coach do that because, you know, he's you the one. to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the one putting, or he or she is the one putting that, uh, all, the, all the puzzle pieces together. You know, you should just be a great basketball player all around, and you will find a team to play on, and you will find the spot that is best suited for you and that's really the best situation. You don't want to be, you don't want to go around and say, "Yes, I'm a point guard. Yes, I'm a shooting guard, or whatever," because that that is not that, that's really not the approach you want to have. It doesn't serve you as well. Okay. 
Hundred percent. You look at LeBron James. I think you know the best player in the world right now. He definitely does not have a position. No. <laughs> Or, or somebody like Kevin Durant. I mean, if you look at Kevin Durant walking the gym, you're like, oh, well, that guy, he definitely plays center because he's seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. Then you see him play, and you're like, wow, that guy has guard skills, and he can shoot. And, uh, you know, he probably wouldn't be nearly as good a player in the post as he is out on the perimeter. So you can never really put a label on anybody just based off of what they look like or what you would assume they would be. Yeah. yeah, and players put that label on themselves as well, unfortunately. Yeah, and just real quick, because I was actually thinking about this before the, uh, the show even, um, a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. All great players have a growth mindset. They're, they, they never come into a gym and say, I'm not a good shooter. I can't handle the ball on the perimeter. They might say, I'm not yet a great shooter. I don't, I don't yet handle the ball well, but they have a very growth mindset. And it, it can apply to the whole aspect of the game. If you have a fixed mindset which is, in our offense, I stand here, and then I pass there. You're right. never going to be a great player. You're fixed. But if you have a growth mindset, you're always looking for an opportunity to be clever, even when it comes to, to referees. I mean, it blows my mind when players have a fixed mindset on what is a foul and what isn't a foul. It's different every game. And if you have a fixed mindset, you're not going to be able to adjust and take advantage of how the game is being called. You're not going to be able to be clever. Man, there are, I don't know any great players that have a fixed mindset about the game of basketball. Oh, interesting thought, yeah. That's right. Or, or even like a victim's mindset too. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, I, I never get the calls or I, I never, you know, have the ball pass me. Things like that are not going to make you a better player. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. This one is from uh, Jeffrey Matthews in the, in the app who says, Hi guys, my son plays every position on the court when asked. My question is, how does he distinguish, distinguish himself? Any thoughts on that one? Make more shots than the other kids. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. I think you've got, like, I think to be a great high school player, you've got to be known for something. You've got to be the best at something. I don't know what it is. And, and, and oftentimes to get recruited to play at a high level in college, you've got to be able to be good at two things. And most, most pros can do three things pretty well. Um, so I, I decide. I don't know what his natural skill set is. Um, but whatever he shows a natural inclination towards, I would say master that first, you know, while continuing to improve your overall game. Um, and once you've mastered one skill, move on to the next. I think it just depends on what people t generally get good at what they take pride in. I think it, what, what, what happens first is taking pride. You know, if someone just says, I'm a three-point shooter, it naturally follows that they're going to be pretty good at three-point shooting because they practice it. If they say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm a beast in the post, well, they're naturally going to work on their post game. So decide what you're going to take pride in, and uh, I think everything will follow from there. Yeah, and, you know, I think also one way to really distinguish yourself is kind of the things that we talked about before with Tyler when we were talking about what coaches look for. And, you know, that might be something like taking initiative or effort, and just being the guy that works the hardest is a great way to be the, the one that, that is really kind of stands out from the crowd. Um, you know, the coaches love guys that are do, that do that without any prompting. So, uh, you know, if you work really hard, you can you can actually distinguish yourself that way. But the major way to distinguish yourself is putting the ball in the basket. And you know, if you're able to shoot, if you're able to attack the basket, those are great ways to distinguish yourself. The guy that that is consistent and makes the basket really. Well, I think the idea that, that Casey mentioned there, which really is big for me, and that is, are the guys who really play hard. Um, they show effort in every situation. They're first on the floor for loose balls, those 50-50 balls, and, and usually they come up with them, uh, and those are, are real positive uh, situations for coaches and players as like. For yeah. sure. Let me, yeah, I just, you made me think of something um, with the hustle piece. So there's a name that you guys, and I'm sure you'll be watching is familiar with, uh, Julius Thomas, uh, tight end for the Denver Broncos. And I actually had the opportunity to coach Julius Thomas in college when he played basketball at Portland State University. I was a, an assistant there. And uh, Julius, he only played one year of college football. His last year he played his first three of basketball. Julius is six foot five, um, and was not an incredibly skilled basketball player. But he was the hardest worker, bar none, um, in the entire program. 
And if there was a loose ball, if there was a rebound, if there was a ball on the floor, he was coming up with it. And he ended up starting at six foot five, starting at center over over a seven foot two guy, just because of his work ethic. Um, and he had a lot of trouble handling the ball and putting it in the hoop, but we couldn't keep him off the floor. Um, and I mean, there's a guy that got a basketball scholarship and playing time at a Division one school based on his hustle. So I completely agree with you. Yeah, and, and that kind of goes back to that question of how to distinguish yourself. You know, some guys maybe don't have great skill sets, and maybe they are unable to really reach a high level of those skill sets, but effort just pays so much de uh, dividends for you and your, your team. It's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, here's another one from It's Jimbo on Twitter who says, how can I be a leader for my team? Some players left my team, and my coach wants me to be a leader for everyone. Hmm. That, that ought to be a Mm -hmm. Interesting question for you, Tyson. Yeah, no, and I love it because, you know, one thing that uh, we spend a ton of time on at our PGC session um, is leadership, especially at the point guard college session. Uh, we spend the entire first day on leadership, and I think leadership is one of the most undertaught skills in the game of basketball um, you know, all across the U.S., and so we spend 24 hours on it, so let me attempt to answer that in two minutes, um, <laughs> but, you know, rush, yeah, right? <laughs> Um, so I think there's many aspects to leadership, but here's one, here's one of the first aspects of leadership um, is this, uh, and I'll go back to another Coach K story here in a moment, but if the only way you lead is by example, I don't think you're a very good leader. Um, Coach K says, you know, we, we got a place for those strong, silent types here at Duke, and it's called the bench. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, one, a lot of players are uncomfortable being a vocal leader. And but it's it's necessary. You you must be vocal if you're going to be a leader. And a, a lot of times players are like, well, my teammates don't listen to me. I don't feel very confident being a vocal leader. And I believe that confidence and leadership comes the same from the same place that confidence in your shooting comes from. It comes from preparation and putting in the time. If if you don't know what to say, then of course you're not going to be a very confident leader. But if you spend the time drawing out every inbounds play, you can be pretty confident saying, hey, John, you're on the block. Hey, Tom, you're setting a cross screen. If you spend the time, you know, uh, talking to your coach about what he wants your team to do offensively and defensively, you can be pretty pretty uh, confident saying, hey, John, stop ball. Sam, box out the big. And so I think the first thing is you've got to get uncomfortable in being vocal. Um, and then the second thing, when your teammates don't listen to you, I think you need to start to lead through attrition. And what I mean is you can't go from zero to, hey, everyone, listen to me and look at me. You need to start leading through individual conversations, one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, and the last thing is this. Even lazy, selfish, bad teammates love to hear praise. And so if the only thing you're saying is you got to play D and you got to make your shots more and why don't you show up early, why don't you work on your own, of course they're not going to listen to you. Nobody <laughs> wants to listen to that. But everybody loves when, when you say, hey, way to get buckets. I see you box out. You're a lockdown defender. And then you kind of deposit into the bank account. And after, you know, six or seven of those, you might be able to ask them, hey, can, can you get a board for me? So I think, I think those would be kind of like a start to leadership. And uh, come see me for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I, I'm right on the same page with you. I think being constructive instead of critical is really a key thing because if you're if you're just there bagging on people, then you know that's that's not a great way to kind of raise morale. It's it's really it's really one of those situations where you want people to look up to you and have you kind of make them feel good about what they're doing and. If that's not the case for, for that particular moment, at least assist them in helping them figure out what they need to know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, being constructive instead of critical is, is, yeah. is or constructively critical uh, is, is a good way to approach it as well. You know, one of the things, Tyler, that I was listening to you talk there and I think about uh, something that we do uh, at SoCal um, is we rely upon our older players to coach players. And oftentimes we'll have situations during practice where you can see there's a conversation going on between two players and uh, the practice will stop until they have an opportunity to finish this conversation. And usually one is directing the other. And, you know, um, there doesn't we don't really have much in the way of hostility toward uh, somebody trying to help you. Uh, they're not sometimes too receptive uh, to you trying to tell them but explaining and kind of actually becoming kind of a surrogate coach as well really seems to work out. And uh, so we kind of uh, uh, utilize this coach, uh, players coaching players 
because there's so much going on on a basketball floor, sometimes uh, coaches don't see it all. Mm -hmm. And the players are so close to what's going on, they do. And so we really rely on players coaching players a lot. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> okay, here's and, and that kind of goes back, I guess, um, to interrupt here, uh, kind of that leadership uh, kind of thing too. Is because You'll find that some players really uh, will administer that time effectively a whole, lo whole bunch during practice, not you know, overdoing it certainly, but they understand that that's important to making everybody better. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, here's one, Tyler. Uh, this is from Jenny Ham in the chat who asks, how can you build better understanding of the game as a player? Mm, I would say really one good. word. I have one word for that, but I'll let you jump in on it. <laughs> okay. I want to hear the word really bad right now. Um, <laughs> hey, first, I think you got to watch basketball. You know, be, become a student of the game. Um, a great, great way to watch basketball is to watch yourself. Get, get video of a game that you're actually playing and watch yourself and you have access to a, a good coach that can help you. They can teach you so much about what you should be doing when you don't have the basketball. I mean, an average, an average player in a, let's say, a high school game, in a 32-minute high school game, average high school player only actually has the ball in their hands for, for under two minutes of the game. That's such a small part of the game, but it's what all the players focus on. You can tell if somebody knows the game of basketball by what they do when they don't have the ball offensively and defensively. So I'd say watch yourself and watch, and watch the game elsewhere. Okay, well, I think that I'm totally with you on that one. I think for me, the one word is just experience. Uh, you can't, uh, just like we said before, you can't just plan to step out on the floor and have everything there. You need to put in the work uh, in terms of skill development and also understanding of the game by doing things like watching uh, other basketball, like you said, just so that you kind of know what's going on. But I think playing experience is the biggest thing that you can do. So if you're out there playing, uh, pickup games or you're playing on a, a club team or your school team, those things really lend to you getting the understanding that you need. And that, you know, that's why when uh, you see players in the NBA and stuff and they're veterans and they know all the little intricacies of the game and everything, it's because they've been playing for so long. They know what things are going to happen, what's going to unfold, what's the next thing that uh, they need to react with just because they've got the experience. And so I think experience is probably one of the biggest ways to raise your aptitude for the game and your, your, your game IQ, really. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll, I'd give, uh, I think it was Jenny, I'd give her uh, one way to kind of cheat. If you, if you don't know the game very well, you can appear like you know what you're doing if you just move. One of the, one of the most obvious ways you can advertise to everybody in the gym that you don't know the game is to stand still. And, uh, and the second way would be to be at a stance, offensively and defensively, when you don't have the basketball. You're, just, you're basically wearing a sign saying, hey, I don't know the game very well, when you're standing straight up. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, Casey used a word a moment ago that uh, you know, I use all the time, and, and I find that most parents and, and their children today don't really understand this word either, and that's the word aptitude. When I was a kid, uh, you know, the schools had aptitude tests that you took on a regular basis to, and the test was really to evaluate what do you know and how do you use it. And I think that's really uh, what um, your, your understanding of basketball is really all about, understanding uh, something and then how is it used, how is it going to apply to the situation. But that's an old timer's view. <laughs> No, I think that's that one's timeless. I think that's tried and true. And and another thing, like, and I find this, you know, I get the opportunity to work with thousands of athletes every year. Every the vast majority of athletes that I work with want a quick fix. Teach me that Dwayne Wade move. Teach me that LeBron move. I'll teach me that crossover, and then they'll think they're a good basketball player. And that is not how it works. You don't become a good basketball player with a quick fix. It takes a lot of time. And you know, everyone wants the trick. There's no trick to being a great basketball player. You know, it takes that experience. It takes the time. And so the trick is change your mindset and uh, invest in the game. <laughs> yeah. For sure. They want tricks or tips. Yeah, tips. <laughs> tips that will make me better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, the tip is put the work in, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. This is this is maybe one that we can answer uh, more than, uh, you know, or, well, let well let uh, Tyler do it. Well, no, what I was going to say is this is one that we can maybe jump in on first, and if Tyler wants to jump in, he can too. But this is from uh, Hamayun Satar, who says, 
Uh, I have a proper shooting form, but my shot just doesn't go in most of the time. Some days I feel like I can make any shot, and other days nothing works. What can I do to get more consistent shot? Um, a more consistent shot. Well, welcome to the world of shooting. <laughs> I mean, that's really how it oftentimes goes. You know, some <clears throat> people figure that uh, they can shoot 70% all the time, every day, uh, and that doesn't happen. One of the things that that is really important in in shooting and uh, is that you have consistent game speed uh, workouts, and secondly, that um, you accept the fact that in the course of a game, you're probably only going to make about three, maybe four out of ten, even in the mid-range shots. And so, don't expect too much of yourself uh, when you're you're uh, doing the shooting and whatnot. And what can you do to get more consistent? Is spend more time. And the thing that that really helps you, I think, consistency in in, in basketball games is just working more at at game speed. Too often, when you spend so much time uh, just at practice speed, the game is not played at practice speed. It's played a much more intense level, and so you have to be able to shoot in that situation. Right, and you know, one of the other things too, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, is just that. When, you sh- when you're talking about any kind of uh, shooting averages or anything like that, that's over a long period of time. If you're thinking of yourself as being a 70% shooter, uh, you know, over the course of one game, well, I mean, one game is, is not over the long run. You, I mean, you might have games where you're really on. You might have games where you're really off. What you need to do is have the kind of the um, confidence where you know that you're going to make the shot before you shoot it, and whatever happened before does not matter. Um, and you just keep shooting, because if you're, if you're going to get in a little bit of a rut, the last thing that you want to do is contaminate your, your mind or sabotage yourself by thinking that the next one isn't going to go in before you even do it. So, you know, you need to worry less about your, your, uh, your shooting averages and things like that and really just work on being consistent and having the confidence every time you shoot the ball and understand that over time it will probably all even out. So uh, don't worry about it so much, I think, is another thing. To think and your about. thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, no, those are, all, those are both great thoughts. And I, I really like these questions, actually, too, because um, we, spend, uh, we spend three hours on shooting and confidence in our PGC course, um, and we talk a ton about confidence. And um, a lot of these questions are things that good coaches don't have time in a season to really address and teach. And I'm, I'm guessing that's probably a lot of the questions you guys get because they got put in their baseline inbounds plays in their press break. They got to win a game on Friday. Exactly. And so, and that's one thing that we at PGC really try to address and specialize in. What are, what are things that good coaches want their players to do and know but don't have time in a season to teach them? Um, and, and the whole, you know, individual confidence and shooting thing is, is one of them. Um, just had a couple quick thoughts. One, the best players miss over half their shots. The best shooters in the world miss over half their shots. And so that, that's the best players, you said. Right? Exactly. So I, you can't expect to be making over half your shots. Um, and then I just completely agree with what you said. I think the, for once you've developed consistent form, I think the top two reasons players miss shots in real games is speed and pressure because they have to shoot faster. And because they're under more pressure, that's why you miss, and that just impacts your consistency. Um, so practice, you got to find a way to practice with speed, and you got to find a way to put pressure on yourself in practice. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, one of the problems with uh, shooting under pressure is just the tension that you, you add to your body. <clears throat> and if you've worked on the game intensity, game speed practice, you're able to relax a little bit more and take all of that energy out of the ball and relax yourself a little bit, yeah. and your percentages will, will start to go up. So yeah. that's definitely a huge key is just the game speed, game intensity aspect of practice. You know, there's another little element that tends to creep in with shooters, and, and uh, uh, oftentimes during the course of the season, they will develop little um, ticks that kind of affect their shot. One of the guys that plays for us, he's a three-point shooter. Um, He doesn't do too much else that's very outstanding, but he does shoot the ball pretty well. And he recently went into a funk, and uh, you could see that it was affecting him mentally. And so uh, I spent time chatting with him, and and, uh, he's not a real easy kid to approach sometimes. And I don't pressure when I feel that way. Uh, I let them kind of approach me. But um, he had developed this tick of having a, a really flat shot. And he had had a really nice arc on his shot, and 
he said, what do you think's going on? And I said, well, uh, thanks for asking, and here's what I think. And I think that, you know, your shot has become flat. Uh, it's hitting that backside rim and popping right out again. I think if you got more arc on the shot like you used to have, I think you'd be way more effective. And so with that, he went away, and uh, voila, that thing started to fall for him again. And it was just because he was un he did not realize that this is what was happening to him as a shooter. And I think this happens not only with art, but other things as well, you know, how we release the ball, et cetera. And so uh, we, we do develop those little ticks, and uh, it's good if, if coaches can help you figure out what it is that is the problem. Definitely. Yeah, and one, and one more thing I will add on that too <clears throat> is we actually have a video on how to have a more consistent shot. Um, and the, the bottom line of that video is that to have a consistent shot, you have to put in consistent practice with that shot as well. So that means instead of having Sunday as your shooting day where you work on your shooting, you actually spend, uh, you know, maybe you spend six hours on that shooting day. That's not as beneficial as spending 30 minutes or, or even 15 minutes every single day working on your shooting consistency and mechanics and all that, all that you can do. Because if you're just doing it once a week or once even less than once a week, then you will not be consistent because you're not consistently working on it, right? Amen. All right. Let's see here. Uh, let's go with uh, here. We'll check Lowell ninety six here in the in the Q and A app, who asks, "I'm going to university next year. I have always played b-ball on my own and have never really played on a team. Is there any way that I would be able to make it on the team there?" Well, uh, maybe we'll jump in on this one real quick. Yeah. Let's say. Uh, let Tyler have that one. Well, I, oh, I was, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, I don't know what school you're going to or where, where you are in the world, um, but if you've never played organized basketball, you've got a very enjoyable challenge ahead of you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's incredibly unlikely. And so if you – being a part of a team, basketball, any sport, I think is one of the most fulfilling life experiences that you can have. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience, and I, I think that it's at an admirable goal to be a part of a team. For you to be a part of that team, having never played before, um, the first thing you got to do is you got to talk to the coach and ask if there is any role on the team that that coach might have for you. That role may be a manager. That role may be, uh, you know, a student assistant. That role may be you get to throw on a practice jer jersey sometimes and uh, mix it up with the with the players, and that might allow you to have a foot in the door. And if you continue to work, they might find a spot for you. But I'd say. Put your, come in and be humble and say, is there anything I can do to serve this team? I want to be a part of this team. And uh, then you'll at least know what you need to work on to get some uh, to get a bigger role. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we're going to say the exact same thing, is that you can't expect to jump into organized basketball without really a background in it. Yeah, that's true. So, <clears throat> yeah, find some way to get the experience, and maybe there's a potential chance that that might happen. It's going to be a really rough road uphill, um, but, you know, if that's and not the case, if you're really tall. <laughs> if you're really tall, you've got a better chance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was reading a story recently uh, where there was uh, a young man that went to, and I can't remember now where it was, but went to a university and, and asked to be a part of it, and they offered him uh, a, one of the manager's job, which he did. And, and oftentimes they uh, would ask him to come out and practice because the people were hurt and that sort of thing. And he began to shine in practice, and uh, as it turned out, uh, toward his junior year, I think they gave him a scholarship to play. Awesome. Uh, so it does happen, but not often. Not often. All right, so we're going to lightning around some of these so that we can kind of get through everybody here in the last few minutes here. Um, but uh, So let's keep the answers as short as we can, but as concise as possible. Um, you've been doing a great job of that. Us, probably not so much. <laughs> um, okay, but here's one from uh, James Robertson who asked, uh, other than the triple threat stance, is there any other reliable stance to use in a game? Um, I, I would say yes. I, we call it power position. It's whenever you're closely guarded, get a rebound, or being trapped. And that's ball tight to your chin and body, elbows wide with a low wide base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, and athletic stance and stuff like that are important too. For mm -hmm. us, we, we are not really big fans of the triple threat uh, stance or position because we think that the game moves faster than that really is necessary for these days. Um, you know, there might be a, a, a you know a, an instance where facing up 
is a good idea, but we also think that if you catch the ball and the opportunity is there, you need to go yeah. and not wait to get into triple threat. A lot of people kind of use that as a crutch, and we don't think it's as necessary as it used to be, really. We use a, we use a little different situation. Um, I'll just take a moment to kind of describe this, and uh, this is just our point of view. And, th and we use the footwork on the catch. We like to call it catch and address. We want to just address the basket for a shot first and not be looking, and often the people in our area tend to teach a triple threat with the ball on your hip. I like the idea that we're going to take and pull around, we're going to show you that we're going to take the shot if it's there, and if it's not, then we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, attacking you or uh, pass the ball off to somebody else. And so everybody that I, I instruct, we always talk about catch and address. And what we do there, and probably not many different than a lot of people, and that is while the ball is in the air to you, we're taking a little short step, and uh, this is how we create rhythm for the shot. And as you take that short step and you turn into the basket, you're ready to go right now. And it's our feeling that by taking that little step, we create rhythm for the shot. And uh, as that rhythm begins to develop, it's amazing to see the look on their face as the shot begins to drop effectively for them. So our stance or, uh, about um, offensive stance is we want to take and catch the addre and address the basketball every time we catch it. We're not always going to be able to do it, but that's what we're looking to do. And we want to be in a low position so that as the ball is caught and we turn, it's on its way if the shot's there. If it's not, we're also in position to attack them off the dribble. Just our thinking. Yeah. Agreed. That's that's good, but I don't think you understand the meaning of lightning rounds. <laughs> uh, I get that same thing every week, Tyler. You're too long, Dad. You're too long. Um, okay, uh, here's one from uh, Irvio or I R V I O U in the chat who says uh, that I'm five seven. I'm actually a very small guard. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is the jump shot. Beside my passing, I'm more of a pass first point guard. At the moment, the only way for me to score is to shoot jumpers. Uh, up to 16 feet if my teammates get double teamed. Should I work more on shooting threes or adding moves like a jump hook? Uh, best wishes from Germany, Eric. Um, I, think, I think any small guard must be a knockdown off the catch three-point shooter or else you, you're going to have a short career. Right. Um, yeah, and I, like we said before, work on all aspects of your game. You want to have every tool in the box that will only help you. Um, okay, this one is from Ronaldo Gonzalez, who says, I'm not yet a great three-point shooter. Is it important for a point guard to shoot from deep, can shoot mid-range uh, from from Venezuela? So that you just answered that question. Yes, you need to be able yeah. to shoot from deep. <laughs> um, let's see. Daniel Sijakowski says, you look a little bit like Macklemore. <laughs> <laughs> I actually get that. Somewhat often, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm from the Northwest. He's from Seattle. I actually saw him live before he blew up, and I'm a big fan of Macklemore. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> and then you look like him, too. That's cool. There you go. <laughs> it's the doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one is from uh, Liam Bold, who is at L. Boldy on, on Twitter, who says, I started playing basketball and don't know what to practice first. What should I practice? And we answered a little bit of this earlier, but uh, maybe a quick answer for him there, Tyler. Yeah, you know, I think um, you got to be able to handle the basketball if you're going to be be a, an offensive player. You know, that's catching, passing, handling the basketball. I think you got to be trustworthy of the ball or else you're not going to see the floor. Um, and half the game is defense. <laughs> and so I'd say spend – the only time that most players get to practice defense is when you play games. And I, I would encourage every young player to use pickup games – practice as an opportunity to train your defense. That should be your focus. It's half the game, and a coach isn't going to play you if you can't guard somebody. Yeah, truly. Right. Okay, we're going to take two more. This one is from uh, Bimnet Tekel or Tekle in the chat, who says, I'm a six foot five point guard, but my coach wants me to play the two and the three, but I want to play the point guard. What should I do to achieve that? I, you know, I think it goes back to first have a conversation with your coach. You know, I, if you have a desire for anything in life, you've got to make it known or else it's probably not going to come true. Yeah. So if you have that desire, make it known to your coach. Um, and, and then display that you have the skills to have the ball in your hands the majority of the time. And the number one skill, when you, if you have a good basis of basketball skill and knowledge, to show that you should have the ball in your hands is decision-making. 
you have to make the right decisions with the basketball, and that's what's going to allow a coach to trust you with the ball in your hands more often. Well, I think it also um, goes back to the other players trusting you as well. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give you the ball if they're afraid you're going to turn it over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, here's your last question here, Tyler. <clears throat> this one's from Ginny Ham again, who asks, what is your favorite basketball quote about hard work? Do you have one that you can kind of knock out off the top of your head? Yeah, so um, here it is. And uh, it's my defini it's a definition of hard work, and um, – it's a quote that I came up with, I guess. Um, <laughs> you can quote yourself. That's cool. Yeah, right. So I and I hustle isn't what you do in big games. It's what you do over and over again when nobody's watching. Um, and and that's really why I believe hustle and hard work is. I mean, everybody hustles in big games. Awesome. Yeah, that is that is great. I yeah. Like that. Somebody make a T-shirt or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Awesome. So, Tyler, I think that was the last question, but we want to thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, you know, I think that that was an awesome show, and everybody got really great answers from you, and, you know, we'd love to have you back on, too, at, at some point, if you would like to be on with us. Um, and, uh, you know, is there anywhere where people can kind of get more information about sure. you and the Point Guard College, uh, social media links and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. Well, first off, thanks for having me. I love talking basketball. It's fun. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to come back. Um, yeah, pgcbasketball.com. Uh, summer registration is open. We've got a number of sessions that are already close to selling out. So if you do want to come visit us, please go to the website, sign up. Um, we have online training there as well. Um, you can follow us on social media at pgcbasketball. Um, that's the Twitter, and then you can like our fan page on Facebook, which is PGC Basketball. Um, I am not as active on Twitter as I should be, but at Tyler Coston, T Y L E R C O S T O N. Um, you your game. <laughs> I know, man. Stuff. I'm, I'm on the court too often, I suppose. Uh, I'm, I'm committed to being more active on Twitter, so you can check me out there. Um, Instagram at Coach Coston, and um, yeah, I would love to see uh, as many athletes as possible, coaches as well. We have observing coaches that come to our summer sessions. Oh, one quick uh, announcement. Really pumped about this. Um, we are launching coaches clinics. Um, we had a couple of trial ones in the fall, and this spring we're um, partnering up with Glazier, who do. Uh, football clinics to put on coaches clinics. We're going to be launching it. Um, our first one's in Chicago in May, and really excited about that. Can have some great speakers, and I'll be there as well. So pgcbasketball.com, you can check it all out. And um, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity, guys. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, you know, one last comment. Uh, you guys also invite coaches to come to your your camps as well. Uh, correct. Correct. Yeah. And uh, I I was reading earlier today some of the comments from some of those coaches and. Uh, it seemed like they are really impressed, with, and I know Stu Walters was really impressed with what he got out of the, the camp. Yeah, and honestly, coaches get more out of it than the players. Um, I, I do, the more experienced you are in basketball, I believe, the more you're going to get out of our summer sessions. We, we teach three ways, hear, see, and do. So they hear it in a, uh, cl a classroom session. We see it. We do a ton of video breakdown of current college and pro players, and we go on court and we do it, and we, uh, we teach different – aspects of the game through that terminology. So, you know, yeah, I think if you're a student of the game, you'd love it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so uh, stay on with us here for a moment, moment here, Tyler. Uh, sure. But I just want to wrap it up and say uh, thank you to everybody for watching. Uh, we will be back next week, Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, make sure you're sending us your questions and telling people about the show just so that we can keep getting great guests like uh, Coach Tyler here. And uh, if we didn't get to your question, it's not because we didn't like you. It's because we ran out of time. Uh, we will be here next week, but we're here all, all during the week, too, so you can hit us up on our social media. We are at Shot Science on Twitter. Uh, you can catch us on Facebook, where, where we are Shot Science, on Google+, Plus, where we have a lot of great conversations going on there every day, and subscribe to us on YouTube. And if that covers everything, uh, I think we'll, we'll catch you guys next time. So do you have right. anything else? Yes, thanks, Tyler, and thanks for your, all your joining us today. That was great. Yeah. All right, you guys. See you Thanks, next time. Guys. See you later.